Hello, this is Shanil Jain with World Medical School and I welcome you to the lecture on hypertension. Hypertension is an extremely common finding in both inpatient and outpatient settings and even more important for the board exams. In this lecture, I will talk about the classification, risk factors, causes, diagnostic tests, and treatment for hypertension. I will briefly touch upon hypertensive emergency and urgency as well. The Joint National Committee on Prevention, Detection, Evaluation, and Treatment of High Blood Pressure classified hypertension as follows. With the help of this table, we can classify the patient's blood pressure into different categories and can give them appropriate treatment. So let's take a closer look at this classification. Normal blood pressure is defined as a systolic less than 120 over diastolic of 80. Prehypertension as systolic of 120 to 139 over diastolic of 80 to 89. Stage one hypertension is defined as systolic of 140 to 159 over diastolic of 90 to 99. And finally, stage two as systolic of greater than 160 over diastolic of 100. No matter what the blood pressure is, you have to encourage the patient to modify his or her lifestyle. No therapy is needed for normal and prehypertension, but a thiazide type diuretic can be used as a first line for stage one hypertension. For stage two, a combination therapy can be used involving ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or thiazide type diuretics. Now, there are a lot of proposed mechanisms for hypertension. One of them being higher output hypertension, which leads to peripheral vascular resistance, which in turn causes cardiac stimulation by adrenergic hyperactivity, and that leads to altered calcium hemostasis. Another theory is that of normal or low cardiac output, leading to high systemic vascular resistance due to increased vasoreactivity. A more common thought is that hypertension is due to increased salt and water reabsorption, which leads to increased blood volume. Risk factors for hypertension. Obesity is the number one risk factor and the most modifiable one. Age. As you age, your arteries thicken and become stiff, which can cause increased blood pressure. Increased sodium causes increased water. Wherever sodium goes, water follows. Decreased physical activity. Increase alcohol intake. Low intake of fruits and vegetables. Increased stress, smoking, African-American descent, and lipid disorders are some other risk factors. There are a lot of things that can cause increased blood pressure. The most common cause is primary or essential hypertension which basically means we do not know what is causing the hypertension. So if I were to ask you, what is the most common cause of hypertension in USA? Your answer would be essential hypertension. What is the most common cause of hypertension in England? It'll be essential hypertension and so on and so forth. There are a number of secondary causes of hypertension. So let's group them into different categories for easy understanding and recall. Vascular causes. RAS or renal artery stenosis being the most common cause of secondary hypertension. It can be diagnosed by listening for an abdominal brewery. Here's a contrast study showing stenosed renal artery on the left and normal on the right. 
This X-ray shows coarctation of aorta. Rib notching can be seen in ribs 5 to 8 bilaterally. There is cardiomegaly due to the heart having to work harder. Figure of 3 sign can also be noted in the left upper mediastinum. Now, coarctation of aorta can also present as unequal blood pressure in upper and lower extremities. Next are some endocrine causes. In primary hyperaldosteronism, there is an adrenal adenoma secreting aldosterone, which causes increased sodium reabsorption, decreased potassium reabsorption, and increased water reabsorption. The next one is pheochromocytoma, the clues for which are episodic hypertension, sweating, tachycardia, palpitations. This is an adrenal medulla tumor. Cushing syndrome presents with moon-like face, truncal obesity, buffalo hump, abdominal stri, which might be due to the effects of increased cortisol. Hyperthyroidism, in which you have a decreased TSH, an increased T4, and presents with hyperfunctioning of all body actions like nervousness, irritability, sweating, heart racing, hand tremors, and anxiety. So in other words, sympathetic symptoms. Hyperparathyroidism may be due to a parathyroid adenoma, part of the MEN1 and 2 syndromes, and hypercalcemia, whose main cause is a primary hyperparathyroidism. Next, some drug-induced causes of hypertension. Estrogen is a common cause in young females who are on birth control pills. Steroids is seen in young male athletes. Cocaine can also be seen in young adults who present with chest pain due to cocaine-induced vasospasm. Alcohol is also a significant cause of hypertension. MAOIs are monoamine oxidase inhibitors like phenylazine and silagiline. When used in combination with other antidepressants, may lead to hypertensive crisis. Decongestants can cause increased blood pressure due to anticholinergic effects. Renal problems like glomerulonephritis, pyelonephritis, and polycystic kidney disease can also cause hypertension. Now, patients with mild to moderate hypertension do not usually present with any symptoms. That's why it's known as a silent killer. But in severe or chronic hypertension, end organ damage can be seen. In the brain, it can present as stroke or a TIA. In the eyes, Retinopathy can be seen. Arteriovenular or AV necking. Microaneurysms, cotton wool spots, and papilledema are common findings in severe chronic hypertension. In the heart, it can cause left ventricular hypertrophy due to left ventricle having to work extra hard to push the blood out of the heart. This can lead to heart failure. Patients with coronary artery disease can also present with hypertension. Hypertension can affect the kidneys as well, causing chronic kidney disease. It can also lead to peripheral arterial disease, which can present as leg pain on walking, which goes away with rest, reduced nail and hair growth on the affected limb, change in color or temperature compared to the normal limb. The diagnosis of hypertension has to be made by a thorough history and physical exam. At least three blood pressure measurements should be made at three visits with one month interval. Physical exam should include an ophthalmic exam with an ophthalmoscope, heart auscultation and palpation, abdominal auscultation for a brui, and extremity palpation for pulses and to look for changes in color and temperature. A standard blood test should be done to exclude secondary causes. CBC, electrolytes, calcium, TSH, 
fasting glucose and lipid panel, urine analysis, and an EKG. Other advanced tests may also be done, like a renal ultrasound for renal artery stenosis, plasma aldosterone to renin ratio for primary hyperaldosteronism, urine metanephrines, and catecholamines for pheochromocytoma and echo for any heart gene. In differential diagnosis, you may want to rule out white coat hypertension by asking the patient to measure his or her blood pressure at home or by going to the pharmacy. Other causes like drug use, endocrine, and renal diseases have already been discussed. Treatment of hypertension involves a combination of lifestyle modification and medications. In terms of lifestyle modification, weight reduction leads to a maximum decrease in blood pressure, approximately 5 to 20 millimeter mercury per 10 kilogram of weight loss. DASH refers to dietary approaches to stop hypertension. It involves diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and low fat dairy products with low content of saturated and total fats. Reduction of dietary sodium to no more than 2.4 grams of sodium per day. Getting regular aerobic exercise such as brisk walking for at least 30 minutes per day, every day. And limit consumption of alcohol. In terms of medications, the first line is a thiazide type diuretic, as it was found to be the most beneficial for initial treatment of hypertension in the all hat trial. Other drug combos like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers can also be used based on the underlying disease pattern and side effect profiles. Now, here's a list of conditions with hypertension and their treatments. For both coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction, ACE, ARBs, and beta blockers have been shown to decrease mortality. For heart failure, ACE, ARBs, beta blockers, and spironolactone have been shown to decrease mortality. ACE and ARBs have shown to slow the progression of diabetes. In pregnancy, alpha-methyldopa, hydralazine, or labetalol can be used. Alpha blockers like terazosin, prazosin can be used for benign prostatic hyperplasia and hypertension. Beta blockers for hyperthyroidism and thiazide type diuretics for osteoporosis. Now let's talk a bit about hypertensive crisis. It involves hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. So how do you distinguish between the two? Let's take a look. Hypertensive urgency means increased blood pressure without an organ damage, while hypertensive emergency means blood pressure of systolic greater than 180 over greater than 120 diastolic with an organ damage. The goal for both is to gradually lower the blood pressure. For urgency, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, or clonidine can be used. For emergency, intravenous labetalol, nitroprusside, or nephedipine can be used. And finally, to emphasize on some high yield points to answer what's the most likely diagnosis question on board exams and wards. If you have hypertension with abdominal bruit, diagnosis would be renal artery stenosis. If you have hypertension with blood pressure in arms greater than legs, that's coarctation of aorta, which can also be associated with Turner syndrome. Heat intolerance, tachycardia, diarrhea, along with hypertension, is seen in hyperthyroidism. Hypertension with episodic sweating, tachycardia, can be seen in pheochromocytoma. Hypertension 
but hypokalemia is classic for Kahn syndrome or hyperaldosteronism and hypertension with abdominal stri, moon face, hirsutism, and central obesity is seen in Cushing syndrome.